Now, when did we first start to think about tomorrow as being different from today? When did the notion that the future was somehow or other going to be different, when did, when did that idea take root? Um, it might seem fairly obvious <laughs> to us that yes, clearly, yeah, the future is going to be a different country, a different place. It isn't going to be the kind of place that we inhabit now. But if we look at history, then we can see that that notion of, the, of, of tomorrow as being different, of the future as being a different place, is actually a notion of pretty recent historical origin. Um, if, for example, you manage to get your hands on the TARDIS and jump in, and it's actually working for once, <laughs> and you travel back to 1751, you hop out of the TARDIS, you find a convenient passerby, and you ask them, you know, what, do you, you know, what do you think the future is going to be like? What do you think the world is going to be like for your children? They would probably tell you that they imagined the world for their children would probably be much the same as it was for them. Possibly with another George on the throne, but other than that, it would be the same thing. So you hop back into the TARDIS, and you travel forward a century. You're in 1851, so you step outside, and you find a convenient passerby, and you ask them what the future is going to be like. What do they think the future is going to be? And they'll tell you something quite different. They'll probably start talking quite excitedly about electricity. Lots of electricity. Oh, and airships. Essentially, it's during that century that the future, as we think of it now, was invented. It's during that, it's during that century that people start thinking about, about society, the way society changes, the way society operates in a different sort of way. I'm really up until the 18th century. People think about society as being more or less in a state of equilibrium. Even when there's a revolution, uh, there are quite a few of those at the end of the 18th century. I mean, think about what that word revolution really means. A revolution is meant to be a return to the status quo. A, rev a revolution is meant to be a return to the proper, normal state of things. But at the end of the 18th century, beginning of the 19th century, you start to see people starting to think that actually society has a sense of direction. Society is meant to be going somewhere. And it's out of that kind of notion of progress, of change, that the notion of the future as some that's going to be different. Yeah, that's where that idea emerges. And Victorian fictures, futures are made, essentially, out of bits and pieces of the Victorian present. I mean, just as, as it turns out, and this is why really this all matters, our futures are made out of bits and pieces of our present. So I mean, let, let, let's, let's start having a look to see how this, how this works. I mean, isn't that a fantastic piece of steampunk? Literally steampunk, actually, since everything in here, as you can probably see, works by steam. Um, this is a cartoon from the mid-1820s. Um, one, one of a number of cartoons drawn by a characterist called William Heath, March of Intellect. There are a lot of cartoons by other people as well as Heath called March of Intellect during this period as well, which again tells you something about how they're starting to think about society. And let's have a look to see you know, you know, what, you know, what have we got here. Um, not so much a horseless carriage as a carriage made to look like a horse, as you can see from what's coming out of the room. You know, this, this, this works by steam. Um, you have cooking by steam, you have all kinds of steams going on around about the place. Uh, in a slight departure, there are boats being pulled along by, by whales in the, in the river. Um, this thing in the middle is quite interesting. This is the construction by the Grand Vacuum Tube Company. I don't know how clearly you can read the writing here. But I'll read it for you. Direct to Bengal, <laughs> is what it says there. Um, and this is what you do. If in this future you're in a bit of a hurry, you 
walk in at one end of the tube, and then it's a vacuum tube after all, you're sucked through at huge velocity, and you, you come out somewhere at the other end in Bengal, presumably. Um, if you're really in a hurry, then you can fire yourself to your destination. So this, if you like, is a vision of the future at the beginning of the Victorian period. No, I assume it hasn't escaped your attention. But this is satire. Yeah. The cartoonist is having a little bit of fun with you know, the notion of progress, the notion of you know, a future that can be invented. But I mean, I think, I mean, there are two things that one can say about that. In the first, in the first place, the existence of satire is itself evidence of the ways in which you know, you know, this new way of thinking about the future was for some people, at any rate, you know, quite jolting and bizarre and unfamiliar. You know, this is something new, this is something different. And also, as a matter of fact, satire as it might be, most of what's being portrayed here, most of what's being satirized here, isn't actually all that far away from things that existed or really were being speculated about. You know, there we have our steam horse, you know, where you know, this cartoon is being drawn you know, right to the beginning of the period of steam locomotion. And early attempts at steam locomotion didn't only take place on railways. There were steam cars. There really were steam cars for a brief period. Um, yes, I mean, the grand vacuum tube is taking things possibly a little too far. But even there, there are ideas about pneumatic railways, you know, where it's the wheels are big, or, you know, the, you know, the, the, the wheels are enclosed in, 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 in sealed tubes that are going to be sucked along. So it's not actually that far away. This is satire, but it's satire that's working on things that people know are being speculated about already. So you can see the future, you can poke fun at the future in cartoons like this. But within a decade or so of that cartoons being drawn, you can go to places like this you know, to see the bits and, f bits and pieces of the future that is being made around you. Uh, this is the Royal Polytechnic Institution. The Royal Polytechnic Institution was established in Regent Street in London in 1836. Well, in 1836, it, it acquires its royal charter a couple of years later. And you go to places like this, you pay your shilling at the door, which suggests to you, amongst other things, that this was a future that was strictly for the middle classes, since a shilling is a fair amount of money in the 1830s and the 1840s. And you go to the Royal Polytechnic Institution to witness wonders. You go to see the ingredients out of which the future is going to be made. Um, these, you know, these, are, these are canals inside. You know, you'll see kind of model steamboats chugging up and down. Um, just at our end here, um, there's a big pool of water. What you're seeing there is the diving bell. If you pay an extra penny, you can descend to the bottom of the pool of water in the diving bell. Uh, there's a diver wandering around in the, in the, in the pool as well. And around, you know, you know, around the main gallery, you know, you'd see electrical machines, you'd see telegraphs, you'd see, you'd see the stuff out of which the future was going to be made. You go to places like this in order to see, the, you know, to think that you yourself are part of this kind of drive towards the future. And of course, by the 1840s, the 1850s, the future seems to be taking place outside of places like the Royal Polytechnic Institution as well. The, te the, the patent for the first electromagnetic telegraph is, a, is a, awarded to Charles Wheatstone and William Fothergill Cook in 1837, I mean, just as the throne is taking hands. And imagine the difference that makes to communication. Well, it takes a little while after 1837 for it to actually take off. But think of the difference that makes to communication. Um, if you want to send somebody a message in 1835, that message can only travel as fast as you can travel, pretty much. 
whether you're on foot, on horseback, horseback um, in a coach, in a train, that's how fast the information, that's how fast the message can travel as well. Once you have telegraph networks, and by the end of the 1840s, the beginning of the 1850s, telegraph networks are spreading across the British Isles. In 1851, the first underwater cable connects England with France, so it's spreading across, across Europe. Telegraph networks are spreading across usually mainly the east coast of North America. And you can now communicate more or less instantaneously. After various failed attempts, in 1866, they succeed in laying a telegraph cable across the Atlantic. And of course, this is what's being, this is what's being portrayed here. You know, there we have the British Lion. There we have the American Eagle. Yeah. Connecting the two, you know, yeah. the British Empire and the growing American Empire of the United States. And literally, you can see this, and they're literally making the world a smaller place, a smaller, more manageable, more controllable place. I mean, that's an intrinsic part of the, of the rhetoric of the telegraph, I mean, throughout, really, throughout the 19th century. Telegraphy is the great leveler. Telegraphy means that everybody will, everybody will know everything, that, me that messages will pass seamlessly from one part of the world to the other. In reality, of course, it means that the telegraph, the telegraph means that it's now far easier for the imperial government in London to keep a closer eye on what's going on in various parts of the world, and indeed maintaining what they call the all red line, there's telegraph cables that only travel or are only passed through you know, countries and areas under imperial control. You know, it's a very, very key kind of British di diplomatic requirement. Remember the telegraph fees fantasies as well. Now, I mean, if you can send information down the wire, and after 1876 and Alexander Graham's Bell invention of the telephone, you can send voices down the wire as well. Why can't you send, why, why can't you send vision? Why can't you see, send pictures? Why can't you send sight through the wire as well? Remarkably quickly, actually, after uh, Graham Bell's invention of 1876, people start talking excitedly about another new invention that's about to emerge, usually called the telectroscope. It's called the telephonoscope in this example here. And the telectroscope, the telephonoscope, is indeed going to be a way of transmitting pictures, of transmitting vision, of transmitting sight by electricity. Um, you see, this is Ponch's Almanac for 1879. Um, again, I'm sure that you can't read the handwriting here, since I can barely read it. Um, it says on here, every evening before, before going to bed, patron meta familius set up the electric camera obscura on the mantelpiece, that's that there, and connect by wire to their children in the Antipodes. So there they are, Mater and Pater sitting by the fireside, and they're they're talking to and they're seeing their children cavorting, playing tennis, courting. If you can see, read the even smaller print down there. The, the mother is asking the sister who the, you know, who the nice young lady is that the brother is talking to. So this is a bit of the future being generated by you know, the, ex the excitement of the telephone. This is in punch, slightly satirical again. But if you read, uh, if you look in the technical journals around this period as well, you'll see very, very detailed technical accounts, technical drawings of what the telectroscope is going to look like, how it's going to work, the details of its operations, which is quite remarkable, really, because there never was any such thing as a telectroscope. The telectroscope is, if you like, a piece of Victorian technological fantasy. It was always on the verge of being invented, but never quite managed to be invented in the end. And the telectroscope that was never quite invented in the end was going to go on show in places like this. Well, actually, not quite like this. It was promised to be on show at the Great Paris Universal Exposition of 1900 
it wasn't. This is a few years earlier. This is 1893 and 1894 in Chicago. This is the Chicago World Fair, the Columbian Exposition. And it shows you, in a way, you know, just how, more, how much more complicated and how, how, much, how much bigger and how more grandiose the future had become by the end of the Victorian period. This, so to speak, is a direct descendant of places like the Royal Polytechnic Institution, you know, a half a century or so earlier. But you know, whilst the Royal Polytechnic Institution is a small building on Regent Street, this is a city. You know, this is the white city. This is built on the shores of the lake in Chicago. It's an entire ground, it's a nice space, this devoted to displaying the future. People come here and they're thousands, they're tens, they're hundreds of thousands, they're millions to see what the future is going to be like. Um, and so particularly given the fun fair is in Aberystwyth this week, I mean, you should, you should cast an eye over there in the distance. <laughs> that is the Ferris wheel, not a Ferris wheel, that is the Ferris wheel. You know, that's the very first, what I used to call as a kid, big wheel. And it was invented to be put on show at the, at the, at the Columbian Exposition in Chicago. Uh, to trump, in a way, Eiffel's tower, the, the Eiffel Tower, which had, been a, which, which had been designed to be built for a previous ex ex exhibition in, in Paris. So it's in, pl in places like these, the, you know, the, Vic the, the Victorian future is being made, and it's being made out of places like this, out of you know, the artifacts, the machines, the displays, the spectacles that are on show here. And of course, it's not just in exhibitions, not in galleries of practical science or in kind of telegraph networks. That's not the only sort of place that the Victorian future is being made. There's a flourishing of scientific romance, what we would now call science fiction, really in the 1880s and the, and the 1890s. You know, we've all heard of H.G. Wells, you know, this is when Wells is making his futures, making his sort of time machines and his War of the Worlds out of the bits and, bits and pieces of 1890s technology and culture. Um, this is a piece of it, you know, this, this is from, from George Griffith's Angel of the Revolution. It's a, fantastic piece of writing. If you can find a copy of The Angel of the Revolution, then you should absolutely read it. It's about airships. It's about war in the air. In fact, it's about anarchists fighting out out of war in the air before the great powers do, and therefore destroying the great powers. But I mean, see what's going on here. This is, you know, we're just a couple of years before the dreadnought, you know, that new generation of huge British warships is invented. Yeah, you know, but this is what we've got here. We've got, dread, we've got dreadnoughts in the air. You know, this is you know, taking the kind of latest technology of Victorian naval warfare and putting it a few thousand feet up in the air and adding a judicious dose of electricity. And that's what the future is, gonna, is, is going to look like. And you see a lot of this at the end of the 19th century, as you do today. I mean, you see factual and fictional accounts about what the future is going to look like, coming together, feeding back and forth one from the other which of course is where somebody like this gentleman finds his role. This is Nikola Tesla. Tesla made a name for himself in the 1890s really, more than anything else, as a storytelling inventor, as a creator of spectacle. This is actually a very created spectacle here since not even Tesla would sit there really. This is a double exposure. But it's a kind of explicit promise of what the future might be like. of electricity, as I said, literally everywhere. Now to finish off, this matters to me, of course, because I'm a historian of Victorian science and invention, so I'm interested in Victorian futures. Um, but there's more to it than that. As I started out by saying, it's, it's at the beginning of the Victorian period that people start thinking about the future in the way that we think about the future now. We still think about our future in the same way that the Victorians did. 
We still invent our futures. We talk about our futures. We speculate about our futures in the same sort of way that the Victorians did. When something like Elon Musk you know, talks about his plans to colonize Mars or to build amazing you know, sort of under underground you know, high-speed transport networks, it all seems very familiar to us, and to some of us it seems quite compelling as well, because he's going about creating his future, if you like, in a very, very kind of familiar way. He's using some very well-used ingredients when he tells us his stories about you know, future Mars and future California transport. Because he's still writing his future, if you like, according to a Victorian rule book. This is how we're very, very used to thinking about the future. The Victorians thought that social progress and technological progress pretty much went hand in hand. You know, so that technological progress just simply is social progress. And we tend to think like that very often as well. And like the Victorians, we tend to think of the future something that's made by individuals, because it's made by invention. You know, the Victorians celebrate great inventions. They, inventors, you know, they celebrate Edison, you know, Tesla's nemesis. They celebrate Tesla. You know, they celebrate James Watt. They celebrate Brunel. And we do the same thing now. You know, when, we, you know, when we think of invention, we, you know, we think about inventors. You know, so we celebrate Tim Berners-Lee. We celebrate Elon Musk. You know, we celebrate individual inventors. And I want to finished with a suggestion that maybe it's time that we stop doing that. Yeah. As the Victorians get further and further away from us in the past, that maybe it's time to start rethinking the rule book that we have for thinking about the future. In particular, that maybe rather than thinking that the future is going to be created for us by great heroic individuals, we might think that, well, no, actually, if, if the future is made by individuals, then that rather makes the future the property of those individuals. Now, if we want to have a future that actually belongs to all of us, then maybe what we need to do is think of the future as something that we can all make, and that therefore we all have some kind of responsibility for. Thank you.